Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to cover the structures of the eye and we are also going to talk about their functions. First, let's talk about some accessory structures of the eye. We have the eyebrows over here. This is basically a structure that helps make facial expression more obvious and also it does play a minor role in protecting the eyes. So when you sweat, your sweat does get trapped in your eyebrows and prevents it from entering your eyes. Eyelids. This is basically the anatomical term for eyelids. This is called the palpebra. So we have the super, superior palpebra and the inferior palpebra. Lacrimal caruncle is this little pink structure over here. Let's see if I could draw this pink structure over here. This is going to be the lacrimal caruncle, um, which basically produces uh, some sweat, some substances that keep the eye lubricated. There are going to be some sebaceous glands and some modified sweat glands in this area that produce that substance. So when you wake up with in the morning with those basically sandy things in your eyes, that those are what's produced by the lacrimal caruncle. They tend to accumulate at nighttime when you're sleeping. Eyelashes. So in between the eyelashes, you're going to have tarsal glands and tarsal glands are basically modified sebaceous glands. They are also going to produce this lubricating substance that's going to prevent the eyelids from getting attached to each other. There are muscles around the eye that help move the eye. I'm going to go over it in the next slide. We also have a lacrimal gland and lacrimal gland is actually lateral so it's going to be around maybe this area over here we'll take a better look it's going to be laterally so keep that in mind that's important to remember when when it comes to naming the muscles lacrimal gland is responsible for producing tears and keep in mind tears are always being produced not just when you're crying and that's important for basically keeping the eye lubricated and hydrated. And then there's going to be adipose tissue. There's going to be a lot of fat around the eye that basically cushion the eye. Here we could see the muscles around the eye. There are six muscles that move the eye. Four of them are going to be rectus muscles. Rectus means straight, and two are going to be oblique muscles. Here's the superior rectus, inferior rectus, the medial rectus, lateral rectus. Again, rectus means straight, so these muscles are basically, they're going straight back. Their muscle fibers are straight. And then we also have two oblique muscles that move the eye superior oblique up here oblique means diagonal and inferior oblique these are the six muscles that are going to move the eye you might ask me how would i know the difference between lateral rectus and medial rectus well you have to look for the um, lacrimal gland it's not obvious on this picture over here but if you look at models there is going to be a little lacrimal gland like this over here. You'll see it attached. So whatever is on this side, the muscle that is on this side, is going to be the lateral rectus. And the muscle that is on the opposite side is going to be the medial rectus. And we will take a look at that in another video. I go over the models in my lab videos, so make sure to take a look at those before you take your lab practical. Now let's go over some structures from the anterior view. Like I said, lacrimal gland is going to be lateral. These little ducts here are the excretory ducts, so they basically 
move tears over the eye. Lacrimal gland is going to produce tears and they're basically going to move over the eye by the excretory lacrimal glands. They're going to wash over the eyes. So it's going to wash over the eyes doing this way. And they're going to drain right here by the lacrimal canals. This is a lacrimal canal right here. And here's another lacrimal canal. Another term, by the way, to keep in mind is the lacrimal canaliculi. I've also heard them referred to as the lacrimal canaliculi. As a matter of fact, that's the term I prefer to use. So this is the superior lacrimal canaliculi. This is the inferior lacrimal canaliculi. And there's going to be openings here on the inner eyelid area. So there's this little opening here. This is usually not visible on the models, but it is there. This is the opening that allows the tear to move into the canaliculi right here. Next, the tears are going to pour into this sac here called the lacrimal sac. Now keep in mind, it is called lacrimal sac on top. Now when it moves down and becomes narrow, it is called the nasal lacrimal duct. So this connects to your nasal cavity. This lacrimal sac becomes narrow and connects to your nasal cavity. And that's why whenever you cry, um, you get runny nose. I also want to briefly talk about the commissure, even though it's not labeled on this video. Commissure is where the eyelids come together. So right here, this area, this little area right here, where the upper eyelid and the lower eyelid come together, this is called the, the lacrimal, excuse me, the lateral commissure. And this little area where the eyelids come together, it's called the medial commissure. This is on the medial side, this is on the lateral side. I want you to be careful not to mix up the medial commissure with the caruncle. Caruncle is this gland-like structure here. Commissure is where the two eyelids meet. Another structure Another accessory, not accessory, but one of the structures on the anterior side of the eye is the conjunctiva. This is sort of like a mucus-like membrane. It's a thin, transparent layer that covers your eyes. So it's like a sheet right here. Um, you can't really see this in any of the models. None of the models that I've seen in our labs have this. But it's important to know what it is and what, what it does. So this is basically like a thin mucous membrane that covers the eye. If this layer gets inflamed or infected, that's when you get pink eye. So this part, <clears throat> we can see that it's a sheet basically. The part that goes over the inner eyelids right here. This is called the palpebral conjunctiva. And again, it's continuous. So, let's see. It's continuous, so it's going to move over the eyes, as you could see, this sheet. And when it moves over the eye, it's called the bulbar conjunctiva. So, it's one sheet sort of like a mucus membrane type of sheet that covers your eyes and folds into the inner eyelids. We're going to talk about the layers of the eye. So we're going to go over the structures one layer at a time, basically. This is supposed to be outer, by the way. There's a typo here. We have the outer fibrous tunic the middle vascular tunic, and the inner neural tunic. 
we're going to start with the uh, with the outer fibrous tunic. Two structures that make the fibrous tunic are the sclera and the cornea. The sclera is basically that white part of your eye. When you look at your eye, the outer white part, that's going to be the sclera. The purpose of sclera is to maintain the shape of the eye. And of course, it's very fibrous. It's a hard, thick layer. Cornea is made out of several layers of squamous epithelium. It's transparent. Um, we're going to see that inside of the, the inner portion of the cornea is going to contain aqueous fluid. And cor I mean, cornea doesn't have any blood vessels. It's actually nourished by the aqueous humor that's inside. Um, the cornea is basically like a window. It's a transparent part of your eye. So when you look at your eye, that transparent part is going to be the cornea. It's important. There's some, there has to be something there to protect the eye. However, it needs to be transparent to allow light in. If light is not allowed into your eyes, vision would not be possible. So let's look at these structures. <clears throat> so all of this right here, this is the sclera, and this glassy membrane right here is going to be the cornea. It's rem really important to remember these terms, be able to identify them, and know their function. So the sclera and the cornea together, because they are continuous, make the fibrous tunic. The middle vascular layer, we have the choroid, iris, pupil, and lens. This will make the vascular part. So we're going to go a layer in. <clears throat> Briefly in this picture, I know it's not perfect. We're going to talk about them more. This is the choroid. So starting out here, this white layer, this is the sclera. Here's the cornea, the transparent fibrous structure. Now moving in from the sclera, you have the choroid here. This is going to be vascular and pigmented. Here's the iris right here. Basically, that color part of your eye. Here's the ciliary body. I'll talk about it more in a second. And here is the pupil. This is opening to the eye. So this is basically a sagittal cut of the eye. The choroid is a highly vascular layer. The main function as of the choroid is to provide blood flow to the eye. The choroid is also going to be pigmented. It is a pigmented layer, and that's important because it prevents light from scattering in the eye. You'll see in a second that when light enters the eye, for vision to become possible, the light has to basically focus on a particular spot. So we don't want that light to be bouncing around in the eye. And that's why the choroid is pigmented, to prevent the light from scattering. Okay, again, let's take another look. Here is the choroid over here. So right below sclera, you have the choroid, this vascular pigmented layer. The iris is basically the colored part of the eye. It is going to be vascular and pigmented. And the iris, the main function of the iris is actually to control the amount of light entering in the eye. The iris is going to have muscles. There's going to be muscles inside the iris. The radial muscle and the circular muscle. These two muscles are both made out of smooth muscle because remember this is involuntary so they're made out of smooth muscle. Let's take a look. Here's the choroid right here and here the colored part of the eye is the iris. And the pupil is going to be the opening. 
we want to make sure that we could also identify this in a sagittal uh, plane. So choroid right here. Here is the iris. And here is the pupil. These are the two muscles in the iris area. We have the circular muscle, which helps with constriction of the pupil, and also the radial muscle. This is the radial one, which will help with dilation of the pupil. <clears throat> so the pupil is the opening of the eye right here. It can be dilated or constricted with radial and circular muscles. So the pupil basically is the structure that allows light to enter the eye. The lens is made of layers of crystalline fibers. It's very hard. It looks like a marble. If you've ever dissected a cow eyeball, you'll see that there's this marble-like structure in there. It's transparent. And it's, if there is buildup of calcified compound, compound, it causes cataract. See, the ciliary body is basically, these are basically muscles, so to speak, that are going to be on the inner portion of the eye and relaxing and constricting of the ciliary body is what helps change the shape of the lens and I'll show you guys suspensory ligaments in just a second so let's see this is the lens over here these are going to be the ciliary bodies right here they contain muscles and processes and they're going to attach indirectly to the lens by these fibers here called the suspensory ligaments. So the suspensory ligaments are going to attach the ciliary body to the lens. And the ciliary body has muscles, basically, that are going to um, basically relax or um, basically relax or contract to change the shape of the lens. Let's look at it on, a, on an actual model. This is one of the important models to remember. This is the lens right here. Now this area right here This is going to be the ciliary body. Now the ciliary body can be divided into two parts. There is a ciliary muscle. So here in this area, you can see the muscle, all of this. And there's also ciliary processes. So the processes, Pick a good color are going to be these like extensions like this these finger like extensions are going to be the ciliary processes so both the ciliary processes and the ciliary muscle are part of the ciliary body here these little lines here these are going to be the suspensory ligaments or the ciliary zonules um, they're going to attach to the lens and basically this is what allows the ciliary body to control the shape of the lens. It's either going to make it more flat or make it bulge. And that's important because it needs to do that in order for light to be focused on the right place in your eyes. Okay, here's a close-up. So I'm going to go over it just one more time. Let's see if I can 
pick a better color. Um, So all of this area over here, this whole area, this is the ciliary body. The muscles, right here, see these muscles? These are the ciliary muscles. So the ciliary muscles belong to the ciliary body. And then these extensions here, as you see them, these finger-like extensions, these are the ciliary processes. And right here, we have these fiber-like structures. These are called the suspensory ligaments or the ciliary zonules. These are going to attach the ciliary body to the lens. And in this way, the ciliary body can change the shape of the lens as it is needed. <clears throat> so if you're trying to focus on an object that is far away, the lens will become more flat to focus light on the right place. If you're trying to focus on something that's very nearby, the lens will become, it will bulge basically. This is one of the important things to remember for your exam. I do want to know how the change, how the shape of the lens changes if you're trying to focus on something that's far away or nearby. Okay, I want you guys for a second or a minute or two, go ahead and stop this video and label this picture over here and make sure you're getting everything correctly. Okay, so let's go ahead and check everything. Number one, the colored part of your eye is the iris. Number two is the pupil right here. Number three, this is going to be the cornea. Remember the glassy membrane? It was removed on top. Um, number four is the sclera, the white part of the eye. Number five is actually the opening to the pupil. I think that's what this picture is supposed to represent here. I think two and five are pretty much the same thing. Number six, this is the choroid, the pigmented layer of the eye. Okay, now we're gonna move into the neural tunic. This is the innermost layer of the eye. The retina is basically going to be this thin, very, very delicate sheet that's covering the innermost layer of the eye. So here, this layer that you see here, this is the retina. As we said, it's going to be a very delicate layer the retina contains photoreceptor cells. Therefore, this is the layer that actually makes vision possible. So in order to have clear vision, light coming in to the eye needs to converge on the macula. Uh, the macula is actually an area inside the eyes on the um, retina that is filled with photoreceptor cells. There's gonna be a high concentration of photoreceptor cells on the macula. And for vision to be clear, light coming into the eye needs to converge on that spot. If light doesn't converge on the macula, the vision will become blurry. So that's what happens when you're getting blurry vision is that light coming into your eye is not converging on the macula. Now this could be due to the shape of your eyeball or it could be due to flexibility of the lens itself. Uh, 
I want to make sure I show this to you guys on the model. This is where the macula is, right here in this area. So naming the layers, this is the sclera. This is the choroid, the yellow part. This is the um, retina, and retina is actually two layers, technically. I'm not going to talk about that in detail in this video. But in this part of the retina, there's going to be a concentration of photoreceptor cells. And this is where light needs to be focused on. It needs to converge on this spot over here. Again, if it converges on the right spot, you have normal vision. If it doesn't, if it's off for whatever reason, it's go you're going to have blurry vision. The reason that the lens changes shapes, becomes flat or bulges, is to allow focusing of light on the macula. If the lens cannot become flat enough or bulge enough, you will have blurry vision, and that's why we have contacts or lenses to basically help focus the light. The optic disc, um, the optic disc is basically your blind spot. It is right on the optic nerve. It's a blind spot because there's no photoreceptor cells found in this area. We don't notice the blind spot because basically one eye is kind of like helping the other. You know, you have both eyes working together and the optic nerves do cross. We can't see them. I, I don't have a picture, but they do cross. So that allows full vision. So one kind of compensate for, compensates for the other. So let's look at it right here. This area this is going to be the optic disc right here. This is the optic nerve. Right in front of it, you have the optic disc. This is where there is basically no photoreceptor cells. I want to make sure you guys could see it on the model. So right here, this is going to be the optic disc. There are, by the way, fluids that fill the eye. So we're going to talk about those fluids. The posterior segment of the eye, the posterior cavity of the eye, is filled with a fluid called the vitreous humor. If you've ever dissected a cow eyeball, it looks like gel, like, it, like you've filled that posterior cavity of the eye with gel. Um, and that gel is called the vitreous humor. The function of vitreous humor is to maintain intraocular pressure of the eye but also in one of its important functions is to make sure that this retina stays pressed against the walls of the eye. As we saw in, in one of those previous slides, the retina is going to be very delicate. And you want to have something there keeping it attached to the walls. Okay, so here's the lens. What makes the posterior cavity is basically everything behind the lens. So the anterior cavity or segment right here um, is in front of the lens. Posterior cavity or segment is behind the lens. So behind the lens in this posterior cavity, you're going to have vitreous humor that's what this fluid here is supposed to represent and this is the fluid that's basically going to help keep the retina attached and pressed against the walls of the eye so here's the lens 
and this portion here right here all of this is going to be filled with vitreous humor but keep in mind behind the lens about aqueous humor um, I didn't really get the chance to talk about the aqueous humor a lot I want to go ahead and talk about that so aqueous humor is actually going to be in front of the lens right here so the posterior segment of the eye or the posterior cavity of the eye is going to be filled with vitreous humor and the anterior cavity so that's going to be everything in front of the lens see if i could draw that in so it would be basically from here to here so in front of the lens you're going to have this portion here is going to be filled with aqueous humor um, the aqueous humor again it helps make sure that the, the not sclera but the cornea is um, nourished but also it helps maintain the intraocular pressure of the eye so if you have been to the eye doctor and um, you sit at this machine where they tell you to look at an image and this little machine puffs into your eyes. Okay, that machine is for testing your intraocular pressure. It is important to have the right intraocular pressure in the eye. If the pressure is too high, it could potentially cause blindness. Now let's talk about photoreceptor cells. We know that these are cells that are contained on the retina. We have the cones and the rods. These skinny long ones are going to be cones. Uh, excuse me, they're going to be rods. So they basically look like rods. Uh, rods are going to be more for detecting night vision. So it's involved in black and white vision. And the cones right here are for day vision or colored vision. You have more cone, you have more rods than you have cones. Okay, the other cells in the retina are ganglion cells. These are they basically form the innermost layer of the retina, and these are the first cells that are going to be stimulated by light. So right here. This is the innermost part of the eye, so the light is going to come this way. These are the ganglion cells right here. We also have bipolar cells. They are cells that receive and send out signals. Um, they receive signals from ganglion cells and send them out to photoreceptor cells. So let's take a look. Here are the ganglion cells. They're going to receive, basically, they're going to be the first ones stimulated. They're going to send signals here to the bipolar cells, and the bipolar cells are going to send them to the photoreceptor cells. Here you could see a rod right here, the skinny long ones, and the ones that have this cone shape here are going to be the cones. Okay, let's briefly talk about vision. Um, <coughs> Again, this has to do with the ability of the lens to focus light, and not always ability, but also the shape of your eye does influence this. Uh, emetropia is proper vision. Myopia is nearsightedness. And hyperopia is farsightedness. As you can see, this could be influenced by the shape of your eyeball. Usually, if you start wearing glasses at a young age it has to do with the shape of your eye but if you have normal vision all throughout your life and as you age you notice that your vision is becoming blurry that's usually due to the shape excuse me the flexibility of the lens so here you have myopia a normal shaped eyeball 
I'm sorry, myopia is short, eyeball, normal, right here, and hyperopia, this is the eyeball that's basically long, longer than it needs to be. So with myopia, this is near sightedness over here. So you could see this is a, someone who has like a normal eye, normal shape of the eye. But this person who has myopia probably has an eyeball that is short. So the focusing of light doesn't happen on the retina where it needs to be. It focuses before it hits the retina. So a person who has myopia, um, they could see objects that are nearby but they have trouble seeing far away objects. Farsightedness. This is typically where the eyeball is longer than it needs to be, so it's kind of long. So the, the focus of light goes past, this is a typo here, past the retina, as you could see here. It doesn't focus it on the retina, it tries to go past it. So people who have this problem um, are able to see far away objects, but they can't see close objects very well.